gone for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. We also turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. Let us see what this says of community. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so in this liturgy of the ordinary, we enter into an important moment, maybe not of every day, but of a given day. And it's a moment that some of you, when I describe it, you're going to be able to say right away, yes, this, this I know. Others are going to be more like, that's not me. Or maybe I need some more of that in my life. I need to find that. What I'm speaking of is when the author Tish Harrison Warren describes making the return phone call that she had received a message to her friend Rebecca, someone that she calls regularly, someone who calls her regularly. Someone who, taking a quote from Madeline Langle, is, as she calls it, a friend of my right hand. She describes Rebecca as the kind of friend, one of just a handful, whose life has become so bundled up with mine that I can't make sense of me without her. She knows me good and bad. We love each other. Now, some of you, as I said, you can identify that friend in your life the moment I said that. Others of you right now are maybe craving to have that friend, to make one of your current relationships maybe deeper on that level. I don't have that, do you think? Well, the truth is, and it's a hard truth, but it's true, is that you cannot just snap your fingers and make a deep relationship with someone, can you? In order to go deep, you have to, I think, have a few things together. I believe you have to have shared experiences. I believe you have to share yourself. I believe you have to become vulnerable to you and with that person. You have to be open and honest. It is these characteristics, shared experience, sharing of self, self-disclosure, being open to vulnerability, being open, being honest, these are biblical practices shared by the disciples, by the ecclesia, by the early church. This is what they lived and were called to live out. Now I believe that being fearful of these same characteristics are some of the reasons why we, some of us, don't have what might be described as a friend of my right hand. We have friends all right, people who know us, but we also yearn for something deeper. The church itself has an interesting relationship with friendships. By its nature and definition, the church is a community. 
It is a group of people gathered together to be together. One person is not and cannot be a church. I'll say that again. One person is not and cannot be a church. Now you get two together, now we're talking church. When a church is doing church, which is doing and growing in discipleship really well, a church is a place for fostering deep relationships. It's for fostering friend of my right hand kinds of friendships. Contrary to assumed belief, you do not and should not have to be an extroverted personality in order to reach out and find a friend. And you should certainly never be forced to find a friend at church, right? Now you two, you look good. Go be deep relational friends with each other. That's not how it works, is it? But I do believe that the church should be fertile ground for deep friendship. As we are called into deep relationship with Christ together. I believe the ground is fertile because we are called here together by God from whatever walk of life and wherever you came from. The ground is fertile because it is God who provides it. It is God who brings nourishment to it. It is God who cultivates it. The ground is fertile. The ground is fertile. But certain barriers must be broken through in order to reach into a deeper relationship, a deeper friendship. These barriers are hard to break through. These barriers are the shields that we put up. And these shields are really good, I'm going to tell you. These shields are hardened through years of practice and wear. We get really good at using them. And often enough, you may come to find, wouldn't you know, our shields go up when we enter the church building. Our shields are used to deflect questions and conversations graciously and effectively. You just had a terrible and exhausting week. Someone says, how are you? Bing! Pretty good, right? You suffer from chronic pain. You pray to God that it would go away. Someone says, how's it going? Bing! All right. Stress and anxiety for the future weigh you down and you cannot sleep at night with worry. How are you doing? I'm getting along. We all have our shields. They go up. We use them well. But let's be real. The Family Life Center after church just might not be the place to go deeper. It might not be the place to open up and have that conversation, to share your true self. What is really going on? But this place and that place is not the all-encompassing church, is it? Someone and somewhere in the church should be that place. Because that is how God intended it to be. You know, Jesus could have done the whole salvation thing all by himself. When you really think about it, Jesus did not need anyone else, no relationships at all, to develop. Jesus could have been a true oracle on a mountaintop figure, where every now and then a person could climb up the rocky mountain to go visit Jesus, get this wonderful word of wisdom, but he always distant, always staying away, coming back down. But that is not how God works. God's message is nearly always spoken biblically in community and to the group. Now we the church, and I'll tell you Presbyterians are no exception, we have put into practice that faith is almost exclusively about my individual relationship and my spiritual growth. It's about my walk, it's about my salvation. Now this attitude was never done heinously, but the consequence of carrying this out over the centuries now, those consequences have manifested themselves. Because then church becomes something other than community. It becomes a place for me 
to fulfill my spiritual needs. Right? Now the bonus is I get to fulfill my spiritual needs with the great friendly people and awesome music and fun and exciting worship and these people with awesome shared values in mind. But the focus remains on me though. Me and Jesus. Now this way of believing only makes sense I think for us. Which is why it's a really tough barrier to break. But this way of believing does not agree with the overwhelming message of the Bible. Because God nearly always sought out community. He puts people in community. He blesses community. He makes promises to community. And even the greatest individual promises we think of, the covenants of the Bible, with Noah, with Abraham, with Jacob, those blessings, those promises and covenants, those involve blessings for what? Future generations and people, future nations, future communities. We read a snippet in Matthew today, and then over and over again in Jesus' preaching, now what did he do? He preached to the crowds that gathered him. He had compassion for crowds. Paul wrote to churches. He gave thanks, as he did today, for communities. He wrote letters that were crafted and purposed to be read aloud, not to one person, to many sitting and hearing. So, I believe more and more being a part of a church, being a part of a radically faithful church, means that you need to work to build up the courage to let down the shield of satisfactory answers. And you need to be ready to enter in to the muck of life with one another. On that, Harrison Warren writes, Christian friendships are call and response friendships. We tell each other over and over, back and forth, the truth of who we are and who God is. We do that over dinner and on walks, dropping off soup when someone is sick, and in prayer over the phone. We speak good news to each other, and we become good news to every other. She writes, my best friendships are with people who are willing to get in the muck with me, who see me as I am, and who speak to me of our hope in Christ in the midst of it. These friends' lives, they become a sermon to me, I don't mean that we give each other pat answers or cheap pep talks. Few things are worse than receiving a neat little package sermon after we've just poured out our fears or embarrassments to someone. Instead, we hold up the experiences of our lives to the word of truth. And I will add, when it comes to church, I would rather have folks shed their Sunday best and their Sunday faces and instead come wearing the muck of the week with them in the worship. Some of you I know have those friendships I'm describing in church. I know you have them. I've seen them here. Others of you are craving it. Probably some others of you are saying, you know, I'm good. Thank you very much. <laughs> we as a church have been experimenting a little bit. We've been experimenting with just how to foster these kinds of relationships, these intentional relationships. And we've done that in a little experiment. A few members are trying that we call a covenant group. It's a small group model, and we've started with one. The great hope of this experiment that we're about halfway through is that you too, if you would like to foster a deeper friendship, that you would have the opportunity in the future for giving a covenant group a try. See what it's like. I have learned through experience of being in it that this group is fertile ground for growing these 
kinds of relationships. So I want to share with you what <clears throat> makes this group intentionally different from many other places and what makes it a place for these friendships to grow. The difference lies in, wouldn't you know it, the ground rules. And these ground rules we go over at the beginning of every meeting that we meet. And I share with you, because in reading them again, I believe these ground rules are great for any Christian friendship, something deeper than the superficial that you have made, already found maybe, and you want to nurture more. Maybe you want to take the steps with someone going deeper. The first ground rule is confidentiality. What is shared in the group stays in the group. <coughs> if anyone has ever been victim to telling something, somebody something deep and then having that spread, you know how painful and hurtful that is. You know how the church has hurt people with that in the past. The first ground rule is confidentiality. The second ground rule is attendance. That making participation in the group a priority is a priority. We try to come and be there. Think of that with your friends, being there. The third one is so very important. No advice giving. Group members, it says, are to care and not to cure. Group members refrain from fixing the problem. Instead, they help bear the burden. Advice is offered only when requested. Brothers and sisters, that's hard, because we want to fix people's problems. A true friend, step one is to listen. Bear the burden. Finally, it is participation. That group members have the right to their own opinion, and questions will be encouraged and respected, and everyone has permission to pass. Say, I just don't feel like sharing. No one will be asked to share what they don't want to, but you're there, and you're present, and you're listening, participating. So this week, as you seek out to live your ordinary lives, ordinary day by ordinary day, perhaps your Lenten challenge this week can become one of examination of friendship, of taking these rules, these guidelines of confidentiality, attendance, listening first, and participation. And maybe you can apply them to some of your relationships. Help grow, build them. Because you know your friend 